That's the thing about the West. If you talk to people, people that I know, like I have friends who absolutely hate psychedelic experiences. Like the whole idea of it drives them up a wall because they're like, that stuff makes me feel paranoid and worried and like take in all of this. They're, they're not coming at it from an approach of meeting the cosmos, right? They're yes. actually just getting in this place where they're staring at this hall of mirrors and they're locked in this, like, they're just, well, oh my God, I'm such a mess in my life and all this, right? Yeah. There's a really funny moment in Curb Your Enthusiasm where Larry David smokes weed for the first time. And he goes into a bathroom and he has an existential crisis <laughs> staring at himself in the mirror because he's such a jerk. He's like one of the worst people possible. And he has this brief moment where he cracks open the book of who he is. And then you can see him just slam it shut as quickly as possible. Yeah. And I just, I wonder if there's something about that mythology and those ceremonies that primes you to to open yourself because the decision to open, like if you go into a psychedelic experience and you don't have this intention of I'm going to meet the cosmos and align myself to it, but instead you say, I'm going to stand myself. I'm going to be strong against the cosmos. Yes. That's kind of where things could, could end up kind of ugly for you. And I, I feel like those indigenous cultures must get that. And they must, it's just well, baked into it, the... It's a whole spectrum of responses. And, you know, we can't forget the biochemistry. It's, it's up to your liver to detoxify the substance. And if your liver enzymes aren't working very well, I mean, you have a certain... Um, <clears throat> psychic ability to deal with the experience and after a bit i i can't do it anymore you know i've reached my limit and the liver says i'm sorry i can't detoxify the drug fast enough to meet where your limit is and that's when the bad trip starts to happen mm. and and it's this you know we always talk about set and setting that's so critical to us, especially now that we're into um, psychedelic assisted therapy, that that the person who is your guide has to go through very serious training. I mean, I live partly in Oregon, and I'm, I'm following very closely the the um, the new law that's passed in Oregon and, and the the stringency of the training that the guides have to go through before they are uh, licensed to to have this function and all of the so many of the early studies at places like Johns Hopkins um, did value that um, setting and having um, at least one and sometimes two trained people who gave you that um, uh, solidity of that other reality so that you didn't um, get lost. You mm. didn't have, a, hopefully, a bad trip. But, I mean, there's always going to be, unfortunately, some people who don't, who have, for what it, for, it's a combination of their psyche and their liver. Um, mm. That are gonna be. It's not something to do um, to do lightly. Um, to go. But I feel like even just hearing the, if you had a narrative going into it, like you're like instead of believing that you're gonna experience paranoia, you had the belief that you're gonna meet this this serpent demon, right? Yes. And everybody's like, "Yo, you're gonna see this serpent demon, and he's gonna show you some stuff that you're not. He's gonna try to scare you." And you had this mentality where it was this shared experience that was surmountable at the same time. And but don't worry, like hold on, listen to what the demon says, and you will be able to see the the, ch the chinks in his armor, kinks in his armor, chinks, chinks in his armor. You'll be able to yeah. slip through there somehow, right? And so there's this narrative of how you pass through that embedded in the mythology. But I think that that also comes from maybe being part of a culture where you have the right to change. And we live in a time where, where if I can speak in broad strokes, most people are pretty locked into the world that they live in. It's hard to change your job. It is hard to change your life. It is really threatening if you have a family and you have some kind of experience where suddenly you realize that what you're doing doesn't fit for you anymore or you know, you know, your parents expect something of you and so you, you have to live a certain way. And 
to, to experience that kind of awakening in a culture that doesn't give you the space to be able to make a radical shift. That's right. Is terrifying as opposed to a culture where the radical shift is inherent as part of, of growing and living. I would say that the indigenous culture doesn't, they don't look at it as a radical shift. Mm. They're comfortable living in two different realities and going back and forth. They're as comfortable as, you know, we are living predominantly in one reality. They're, they have that comfort level in, in the two realities. And, um, you know, the, um, you know, there's some evidence that the Eleusinian mysteries and the Greeks, that they would take the young people as part of their uh, ritual of becoming adults. They were given uh, mush a brew that contained mushrooms. And to, to be able to be comfortable with this other reality um, starting fairly early in your life, that it it becomes not such a not such a big deal and you're taking them within a community of people mm. who who um who share that consensus uh, ability to go back and forth between the two the, the two realities that that each just as you get a lot of wisdom when you're a child from from your elders you also get wisdom from the plants and from the animals. It's just, it, it, it's an expanded reality, maybe not two, two different realities. It's all part of one expanded reality. Maybe we can mm. think of it that way. Mm. It, it has to have something to do, though, with the integration of humans into nature, though, right? Because, okay, so let's say you live in New York City and you decide to get attuned to the animals. It's horrifying. You get attuned to the New York City pigeons and they all have weird tumors and they're missing legs and pizza rat. Pizza rats and it's just the the animal world that you attune to in these urban places is not an animal world that is very reassuring or comforting. It's yes. it, it seems to there are alarms. Even in Oregon where we're at, there's no animals left anymore. It's yeah, weird. like it's really creepy. We go into the woods and it's empty. There's there's not really birds. There's not deer. There's not the the rivers are pretty not empty. Not that much fish left anymore. Yeah, there's not really fish. There's not really beavers. Yep. And so you yep. wander around this landscape. Like I used to give backpacking tours, and I would take people up Mount Adams. I would take people up Mount St. Helens. I would oh. take people for four days on the PCT. I saw in in all my time of guiding one deer. And these are these are these are backcountry trails where you're yep. you, you're you're out of cell reception, you're on actually a lot of them were on tribal lands, and there's and even there where there's there's a concerted effort to regenerate the landscape, it still feels like it's almost like you're wandering through a model home, where like the trees are there, the plants are there, the huckleberries are growing, there's ferns, it's pretty. But where are the inhabitants? Well, I'll tell you. I here here in Tucson, um, we live very close to the Santa Cruz quote river, and um, most of the time it's a dry riverbed. It comes up from Mexico. It's quite a long distance, and um, um, maybe six, eight, ten. I'm not even sure when they started the county. Um, you know, water in the southwest is is a critical issue, and the aquifers are drying up. So the county has built a number of water reclamation plants, and um, one of them, I think, two of them are built near enough to this dry riverbed, so that half of the reclaimed water goes back to industry, but the other half is pumped, um, not pumped. It's allowed to to go into the riverbed and they began it by carving a channel so that it wouldn't just spread over the whole riverbed and evaporate and, and you'd lost it from the beginning. So, so when the river from the reclaimed water was guided into a, a, a fairly narrow channel, um, maybe six or eight feet wide, what happened was 
not surprisingly in retrospect, um, all these dried seeds that were there, green came up on both sides of it, and waterfowl came back, birds came back, coyotes are seen in, in there, um, even occasional bobcat, uh, javelinas. So all of the so they're they're ready they're ready to come back. Mm. <laughs> it's it's really wonderful to see, and I um it's a place where I walk every morning, and so over the years um we spend half the time I forgot you guys were also in Oregon, so we spend half our time in Portland and half the time in Tucson, and it's been wonderful just to see that slow reemergence of of all um of all that that life. Yeah, there's a, there's a feeling that I have where we we have a, a sense right now of you know the the pending disaster for the earth, but there's also plenty of evidence to suggest that if we just stopped inflicting the damage, that there's enough biomass and there's enough biological history that it could regrow and it could come back, and that nature is not at risk of permanent extinction. What is it at risk? Is it's at risk of... Alienation. Alienation. And as and it's weird, too, because all of these things were done to nature because at the time they seemed like the right thing to do. You have animals that attack livestock. You have animals that carry disease. You have all of these reasons to push nature away as far as you can and to create the safe barrier. But what we've done is we've created these, these spaceship bubbles in which we live where we're not subject to the natural turns of the environment. And so when the environment starts to turn in a way that threatens us, where it threatens our systems of, of how we grow food, of how we get food to our, to our stores, then we start to panic without realizing that the best way to deal with it is to seek resilience in the face of the change that's coming. Sure. I think when you said um, it's the right thing to do, um, the problem is um, we've conflated we have the right to do it with it being the right thing to do. And those are two very different things. I, I, <clears throat> there was an old um, New Yorker cartoon I've always remembered. Um, there's a lot of cartoons where... Um, the seeker is crawling up the side of a mountain and the guru is sitting on the mountain. And this is one of those cartoons. And the seeker is just about to get to the guru and start asking him, you know, what's the secret of life and everything like that. When a jet plane goes over um, the mountain and the guru looks up and says, yes, he says, um, they, let's, let me get it right. He says, they have the know-how, but they don't have the know-why. And and that's that's it. There's, we're we're so out of balance between know how and know why that we conflate um, the the right thing to do with the right to do it. You know, and and they're very they're very different things. We de we decided we have the right to use nature and to um, use it for our purposes without understanding the unintended consequences but where where else could all the know why live but inside of some shared mythology it seems like that's what's being right. primed in these ceremonies is is the shared mythology that like if you look at our mythology wherever it lives uh maybe in netflix or something it's kind of a <laughs> catastrophe it's kind of an apocalyptic cosmology sure. right all of these futuristic movies end in dystopia and things burning down. And this is, if there's a shared vision, this is kind of what we have. And the question is, how do we, can we change that? 